Dear students, I, Dr. Pooja from CSIO Chandigarh, welcome you again to this Jigyasa ATL 8 webinar. In this series, as you know, we are having lectures from eminent speakers, scientists on various topics, which is of interest to the So I all the students who are listening to us to kindly keep themselves muted. And if they have any queries, they can put their question in YouTube chat box as well as WebEx chat box. So today with us uh, to speak on very interesting topic, which you all are aware is Dr. Subhaji, who is the speaker for today's talk. So let me take opportunity to first introduce Dr. Subhaji Kuswar. Dr. Subhaji is graduated in veterinary medicine from Kolkata. He was a gold medalist. He did a um, uh, um, master's in veterinary science in virology from Indian Veterinary Research Institute, IVRI, UP. Uh, his doctoral degree is from University of Cambridge, UK, with the Cambridge Nehru Scholarship and Overseas Research Studentship Award by universities in UK. Currently, he is holding the position of principal scientist, infectious disease and immunology. Dr. Biswas has research experience and peer-reviewed publication in virology involving different pathogenic viruses like herpes, hepatitis B, dengue, foot and mouth disease. Recently, Dr. Biswas has made an interesting discovery that many Indian Kala Ajar cases involve a triple pathogen phenomenon. He linked the presence of a virus in Kala Ajar patients. This virus is present with Liptomonas, a protozoa that co-infect Kala Ajar victims along with the primarily causative agent. So today too, uh, he is going to speak upon a very interesting topic because for last four or five months, uh, there have been a lot of restriction the way we uh, the world used to be there because of a small virus. So we should know what about these viruses are, how uh, infectious they are, how one could get prepared, a mankind could be get prepared. So he will speak up on virus or us, who will smile the last, the tug of war continues. So very interesting title he has chosen. So without uh, not uh, taking much of uh, time between you and Dr. Subhaji, I now invite Dr. Subhaji to deliver today's talk. Dr. Subhaji, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Pooja. A uh, very warm good afternoon to all my listeners. And I would request you not to send annotation requests frequently. You can ask questions at the end of the talk. So let's begin the talk. So the question is, what are viruses? Let's see. It's not moving. Let's see the microbes at a glance. So viruses are microbes because we have to see them with microscope, actually electron microscope. So let's see what are bacteria first. They are prokaryotes. You know, they have primitive nuclei. They don't have a nuclear membrane. Then you have the eukaryotes, which have nuclei or nucleus with proper nuclear membrane and under that you see there are microbes like autotrophs which are algae they can make their own food and then you have the heterotrophs which cannot make their food for example the protozoa like leishmania giardia amoeba they also are microscopic and then you have the fungi like yeast saccharomyces cerevisiae microscopic fungi but you, you will be surprised to see that viruses are neither prokaryotes nor eukaryotes they are often considered intermediate between living and the non-living. This is very fascinating, and I will explain you why. Let's go to the next slide. So, so let's see how the, what is actually a virus. So you see, they are not cellular. They are acellular organisms. Their genome consists of either DNA or RNA, never both, unlike other organisms and higher organisms like us. They are obligately, they require the host cells for multiplication and formation of progeny virions. Interestingly, 
viruses they shut down the infected host cells from doing their actual function this is very very interesting viruses they cannot produce energy or atp molecules as you know they are currency molecules for energy and they cannot synthesize their proteins on their own and that is why they take control of the infected host cell and direct them to do these functions for the virus production and listen carefully the host cell which is infected by the virus forgets its own function that's how the virus takes control of the cell next slide now let's see why viruses are considered intermediate between living and non living you see viruses have this unique property that they can be crystallized just like your inorganic crystals of sugar molecules or sodium chloride you see crystallization is a property of inorganic matter so viruses have this unique property of getting crystallized and on top they are still infectious and that's why outside the host they sometimes behave as non living objects but inside the host they gain the capability of replication and producing progeny virions for discovering this wendell meredith stanley was awarded nobel prize in the year 1946 so you see they are very unique microbes how small are viruses you may have seen such slide before but if you see if you take your school uh, your classroom ruler uh, which is about say 15 cm the smallest division on it is a 1 mm if you divide it 1000 times it becomes 1 micron if you still divide it 1000 times it becomes 1 nanometer now the viruses the size ranges from say about 20 nanometer for very small viruses like circo virus or foot and mouth disease virus and the largest of the viruses have a diameter of about say 200 nanometers the pox viruses here you are seeing an influenza virus which has a diameter of about 100 nanometer another cold virus corona virus as you are all familiar now it is also having a diameter of about 100 nanometer and how abundant are the viruses you cannot see them because you need electron microscope but they are so abundant that you can see up to a million to 100 million virus particles present per ml of sea water 1 billion of viruses can be found per gram of soil so next slide so you see a virus has a very basic structure and you see that this is called an icosahedron if you remember the last picture this is a nature's very strange structure of packaging the nucleic acid of a virus now a virus actually has just this coat of protein and inside that the nucleic acid is packaged either dna or rna and that is sometimes associated with some other proteins like the nucleocapsid protein as you can see in uh, coronavirus but this is a very unique structure which most dna viruses and many rna viruses have other than that on top of that some viruses have a envelope of lipid if you remember the last slide where i showed a structure of a virus that lipid often has certain proteins projecting out of it and they are called mostly they are receptor proteins like the famous spike protein of coronavirus so what characterizes an icosahedron it has these 12 vertices red dots these triangular 20 faces and these 30 edges so that is a very peculiar structure it has it is called an icosahedron and you will be surprised that the word virus is actually derived from latin greek and even sanskrit because in sanskrit it means vish and from there it has come virus in latin and it all these languages it means slimy liquid poison okay next slide no no previous yeah so now you see the real electron micrographs of actual viruses this is rift valley fever a bunia virus which causes hemorrhagic fever this is the papilloma virus a dna virus which can cause cervical cancer in women this is the ebola virus a filamentous virus you can see it has a helical symmetry it doesn't have a icosahedron icosahedron symmetry is present here so viruses can ha have icosahedral symmetry or helical symmetry and then you here you see the famous hiv which can cause aids hepatitis a virus which can cause food poisoning and hepatitis jaundice acute hepatitis this is the hunter virus which can cause a disease very severe called hunter virus pulmonary syndrome this is herpes virus and here you can see you can see this is an envelope virus and you can see the icosahedral structure inside this is hepatitis b virus which is a blood borne virus and can cause chronic jaundice and sometimes even liver cancer 
this is influenza which is a helical virus and this can you know it can cause cold this is very peculiar this is bullet shaped virus vesicular stomatitis virus but the most common member is rabies virus under rhabdoviridae they have bullet shape they are also helical symmetry virus this is human metanuma virus discovered in recent years and we, here you have the famous sars coronavirus where you can see it is a rna virus with a helical symmetry and you can see the spikes projected out of it they look like a crown or the rays of a sun and that's why they are called coronaviruses crown corona from crown okay next slide now all uh, i want to show you that how the viruses for different diseases and how to recognize them this is you see the diseases caused by dna viruses which have dna as the nucleic acid so this is caused this is cold sore caused by herpes simplex virus this is chicken pox which happens in young children you have seen and it is it is not actually caused by pox virus but it looks like pox that's why it is called chicken pox it is caused by human herpes virus 3 and later in life some people can develop recurrence of this virus and it can cause a very painful lesions along along the nerves called shingles this is the notorious small pox which we have now eradicated by vaccination now let's go to rna viruses you you are familiar with the names this is mumps which can cause parotitis then you have measles and then you have rubella so children are given mmr vaccine to prevent these viral diseases and you can see that most of the viral diseases if you take a note they have skin manifestations they cause rash just like even dengue so that is one feature of viral diseases next go to the next slide so you see they are very small and we cannot see them and they are all around us so to deal with pathogenic viruses we have to work in specialized laboratories like biosafety laboratories level 2 level 3 and level 4 this is an old photograph of a high containment bsl4 laboratory where you can see we are like army people we have to fight them very carefully they are wearing ppe and even they have their own supply of oxygen you see because they cannot inhale the air inside so these scientists are working in a high containment laboratory with viruses like ebola marburg hanta viruses like that so this is very exciting if you want to work in such laboratories you have to train yourselves very well so so if the viruses are our enemies we have to know this enemy first how many they are how they attack you and how we attack them so let's see what we know about them let's take the example of dengue i will tell you a little story about it dengue because if you forget corona this is the most important viral disease currently plaguing our country or the indian subcontinent latin america so you see this is a subcontinent virus latin america so you see nanometer in diameter now it has four serotypes 1 2 3 and 4 now don't get scared maximum dengue infections are asymptomatic but some people show infections and majority of them show what is called a dengue fever but some of them may complicate and that can proceed to dengue hemorrhagic fever and some of them need to be hospitalized because of hypovolemic shock which is called dengue shock syndrome and here also you see dengue causes rash so we are working with this virus in our laboratory and i will tell you a little story how we work next slide okay just giving you a little interesting fact that almost 40% of the global population live in the risk of dengue infection 0.4 billion people are affected each year and about 96 million people they report with some sort of severity say dengue fever or hemorrhagic fever or shock syndrome let's go to the story now so we have done little okay next slide please so this is a little paper from our laboratory uh, and you can read it well but the main finding is that we looked at dengue fever in 2015 and 16 and not only the human samples we also looked at mosquito samples and the larval samples whether they contain dengue and we found that lot of them mosquitoes and the larvae they contain the dengue virus the mosquitoes and the larvae because dengue is spread by the bite of aedes mosquitoes which you all of you know now the scientists question is why dengue happens just after the rainy season next slide please and another question is why dengue happens more in the urban countries or urban cities like delhi kolkata and not much in the rural areas relatively less number so you see this is the question 
So what we do as virologists or as scientists, we observe, we imagine, and we conjure up a story that this could be the possibility. And this, this is called what we call is a hypothesis. And then we do experiments to prove whether it is right or wrong. And what we found that majority of the uh, larvae or the eggs are infected with dengue virus. What does that tell you? What we understand is you see mosquitoes are infected for life. When they lay the eggs, then those eggs are infected. Now what happens during the hot spell and summer months, these eggs, they stay dormant in the moist mud. But with the onset of rain, these eggs hatch and the mosquitoes come out in large numbers and essentially they are carrying the dengue virus because they have got it from the mother mosquito by transovarial transmission. So now you see why in Kolkata or in Delhi, lots of urban sites, construction sites, and they have safety tanks. So all the eggs can be well protected there and with the rain and the water there, they can come out. So all the mosquitoes coming out after the rains in the cities, they essentially carry a lot of dengue virus because we saw that they are much present in the larvae and in the mosquitoes. And that's why all the human population becomes susceptible to infection. In the, in the rural areas, what happens? The mosquitoes lay eggs in the water bodies. But imagine in those water bodies, you have fish, fishlings, tadpoles, the frogs and the toads, they eat up the mosquitoes. So the number of eggs is kept low. So the number of infected mosquitoes coming up out is less. So you see how from the findings, we can get an explanation to a very interesting question that may arise in your mind. Okay, next go to the next. Now, how do we detect these small viruses? We cannot see them. It is not always possible to see under electron microscope. So we have very specialized molecular biology techniques, polymerase chain reaction, by which we can amplify a particular gene of the mosquito, sorry, a particular gene of the target dengue virus to such level that millions of, millions of uh, copies of the target gene are produced so that they become visible in the gel under UV light. So you see, we have developed specific PCRs, and though by that we can see that this is Dengue 1, these size fragments are Dengue 1, this is Dengue 2, this is Dengue virus serotype 3. So in this way, we can detect it. And even if you want to know how many copies of the virus is present in a given human sample, like your, like your swab, which you are giving for corona testing, we have advanced PCR technique, which is called real time or quantitative PCR technique, by which you can actually measure how many copies of the virus nucleic acid, RNA or DNA is present in a given sample. So these are techniques when you study virology or study bio molecular biology, we learn about these techniques. Let's go to the next slide. Now, sir? that was nucleic acid. Sir? Now, how sir, 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 sir. Know, now, how will you know that infectious virus, how will you work with infectious viruses? Because you have to test the viruses in animals or in cell culture. So this is, you see, a plastic plate with vero cells, African green monkey kidney cell line grown on them. Now, what? how will you know how many virus particles are there? You cannot even see them. So what we do from a given sample, we make 10-fold dilution, 100-fold dilution, 1,000-fold dilution, and we put them on the cells. And over the cells, we put a medium, which contains a jelly-like substance, so that it prevents the virus from spreading upwards. It spreads sideways and kills the cells surrounding it. And in the process, they cause holes. So when later we remove the media, stain the cells with crystal violet, that's why it is violet in color, we can see those holes. And by that, we can know that number of holes, number of infectious particles were there, and that we call plaque forming units. So by counting these, you can see, we can see at 1,000 fold, there are eight plaques. So there must be 10 fold more 80 plaques, 800 plaques. And in this way, you can know that in a given sample, there were 8,000 plaque forming units of the virus. So in this way, in cell culture, we can know the number of virus infectious part, uh, the titer. And how we make use of that? Next, go to the next slide. So you see, then we use those numbers to do antiviral assays. These days you want antiviral to kill uh, coronavirus. So how will you test whether a drug can kill a virus? So what we have done here, if you just see 
that all these whales, they have received about 50 to 60 virus particles or plug forming units, and they have formed the same number of plugs. Now, this has no drug on them, so they have grown very clearly. Now, we have increased concentration of drug, 0 0.01, 0 0.03, then you have 0.05, then 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3 microgram of a given drug. And you will see that with the increasing concentration of the drug, the number of plaques are reducing. So this drug is fantastic. It is having an action on the virus growth in cell culture. So you see 0 0.5, you have few plaques, and at 0 0.1, you are not seeing any plaque almost. So let's go to the next slide. I will tell you what virus it is. This virus is herpes simplex virus. You see, when the virus is, as I said, when you give a gel in the overlying media, the virus cannot spread up, but it spreads sideways and kills the cells in the surrounding and form these plaques. Like rounded up, the cells when they die, they round up. And when you stain them, these rounded cells are gone, and you can see these holes in the cell sheet so that you can count the plaques. Now here you see drug A, number of percentage of plaques reduced against increasing concentration of drug is plotted here. This is in log scale. So you know from your mathematics that minus one is 0 0.1, and this is one microgram of the drug. So you see drug A is better than drug B because at 0 0.1, this has killed 100% of the viruses, and here one microgram of drug B is taken to kill that. So from here, we can see from this graph that drug A is better than drug B. At this concentration, which is lower than this concentration here, it has killed 50% of the plug. So by this, this is called gold standard, and by this means we can actually compare two different drugs which one is better or whether they have an action or not. So with increasing concentration of drug, if the number of plaques fall, then this drug has an antiviral effect. This is how we first check whether a drug has a good action in cell culture before going to you know, animal models and clinical trials with humans. So this is the famous herpes simplex virus. As you can see, the electron micrograph, it causes cold sores, and sometimes it can cause fatal encephalitis. Next, go to the next slide. So now you see, Virus is made up of many proteins, as you see. And what are the functions of those proteins? So those proteins can be structural or non-structural. For example, spike protein is a famous structural protein of coronavirus. As you know, it helps to form the structure of the virus. NS1 is a non-structural protein of dengue virus because the NS1 is produced in the cells that are infected with dengue, but they don't form the, they are not taken as a part of the structure of dengue virus. So it is non-structural. How will you know that whether a given toxin or this protein is toxic to the system or not? Because you know, virus is poison. So the, for that, what we do, next slide, please. We cut the gene that expresses that protein we cut the gene that expresses that protein and we put it in a vector, another carrier molecule, just like you, your spike protein is, is now put in the adenoviral vector for making the Oxford vaccine. So like that, we then transfect them into cells and see that, that, uh, yeah. So it's, there is a kind request to go a little bit slow. The student okay. is asking for it. Yeah. Okay, so you see, we have a vector in which we put that protein, the gene which expresses that protein, we put it in that vector, and then we transfect the cells with that vector. So what will happen, the cells will express not the entire virus, but just that protein. And in that you see, when we just put an empty vector, transfect them into these HUH7 liver cells, the empty vector does not produce any effect, but when the empty vector contains the NS1 dengue virus gene, it expresses the NS1 protein. And you see it causes death of the cells. After 48 hours, you see the cells are dying. They are rounding up, so they are dying. So it shows that NS1 is toxic to the cells. NS1 can kill your liver cells. So that is one way of just seeing the functions of different proteins of the virus. So you see NS1 is, that's why it is called a virotoxin because it has toxic effect on the liver cells. And you know, in dengue, the liver is often affected. Let's go to the next slide. Now, this is a very clumsy slide, but this also gives you the war room picture, how we fight the viruses. So pay attention. So how your body first fights the viruses. So you see, the virus enters your body. Now, what your body does, there are so many viruses around us, so we are not infected by them. They are, some of them are disease causing. Now, how we fight the different viruses? You see, viral nucleic acid, DNA or RNA, and their proteins are actually foreign to our body. Our body don't recognize them because they are from outside. So they are called pathogen-associated molecular patterns or PAMPs. 
Now, our cells have certain specific molecules called pattern recognition receptors. They recognize those foreign patterns. They are called toll-like receptors. And these toll-like receptors, they recognize the foreign viral agents like nucleic acid and proteins. And these receptors then bind to the viral components and trigger nearby healthy cells. They give an alarm to the healthy cells and say, produce some protective agents, which are called interferons. Now, these interferons initiate a protective mechanism to kill the virus-infected cells and destroy the viral nucleic acids. This is the fast-line defense. This is called innate immunity, right? But if the virus still progresses to infection, is not destroyed by this system, then more adaptive immunity comes into action, which is, you can say, a better army. So what is there? Just like your border security force or BSF, Jawans, in our body, we have the sentinel cells. They are lurking all around our body, looking for these sort of attacks. And some of them are called dendritic cells. We also have the Langerhan cells in the skin, Kufa cells in the liver. What they do, they are macrophages. So they eat the viruses, lies and crosses them, and present these viral chopped up proteins in small parts called antigens on specially designed presenting molecules, just like bouquet of flowers, they present these chopped up viral proteins to our immune system. These presenting molecules are called major histocompatibility complex molecules or MHCs. And these MHCs then present the viral antigens to the actual soldiers in your blood. They are called B cells and T cells. The T cells, they destroy the virus infected cells, killing them inside. That means they put granzymes or certain enzymes in the infected cells and kill the virus inside the cells. Some T cells help the B cells to develop further and produce, as you all know, antibodies. These antibodies coat the virus particles outside the cells and neutralize them. Like the virus, like dengue present in your blood, that will be killed. Hepatitis B will be killed in the blood. So this is called killing them outside. This is our defense system. But the virus also has ways of avoiding these. That's why they can cause disease. Otherwise, they would not have caused disease. And this is also, you have to remember that why 80% of coronavirus infections are asymptomatic because your system can fight them. But then the remaining 20%, the virus gets the upper hand because of defects in your immune system, maybe, because of other diseases, maybe. So let's see how the virus has ways of avoiding your immune system. So they develop resistance to antiviral drugs and the vaccines by acquiring mutations in their genes. So they change their genes. This results in changes in the viral proteins because the genes express the viral proteins. So your antivirals can no longer interact with the target viral protein to inhibit it, or your vaccine-induced antibodies can no longer bind to the target surface protein on the virus to neutralize the virus because the virus has changed. And interestingly, and you will be surprised to know, majority of the RNA viruses like influenza, corona, dengue, they muted more because they do not have a repair mechanism to prevent the mutations. You see HIV, influenza, dengue, chikungunya, they are RNA viruses. So they can mutate much faster and more effectively than DNA viruses. And often the virus takes very, very, very interesting strategy. For example, the HIV replicates in your same T cells, your own soldiers, and destroy them. So your army is getting killed by the virus itself. Gradually, your immune system is debilitated and so HIV causes immunodeficiency syndrome, human immunodeficiency virus. So viruses have many such strategies to avoid the immune attack. Let's continue with some interesting facts for you to understand in the current scenario. You see, listen very carefully. Viruses like dengue come with different variety of env enveloped proteins. Their enveloped protein is different for serotype 1, serotype 2, serotype 3, serotype 4, so that antibodies to one serotype can actually protect you from the infection with the same serotype in subsequent attacks. But they cannot neutralize another serotype, say Dengue 2. That's why people say first time Dengue is not so dangerous, but second time if you have Dengue, then it may be dangerous. How? Because instead of neutralizing, antibodies to serotype 1 will, may actually help the serotype 2 to infect your cells more. And these antibodies are actually not neutralizing the virus, but actually helping more infection by a process called antibody-dependent enhancement of infection, or ADE. 
Don't get confused here. The antibodies are actually bringing the virus closer to the cells, cannot neutralize the virus, and actually helps the virus to enter the cells more and establish more infection. So this is called antibody-dependent enhancement. And ADE is observed in dengue, other flaviviruses like Zika, in HIV, and also certain coronaviruses like SARS. So this is another way how the virus, by changing its coat protein, can you avoid your antibodies. Some viruses infect us, and voila, their genomes get integrated into our own genomes. For example, HIV, sometimes HBV. So the viral genome is in your own genome. Actually, you'll be surprised to know 0.3 to 4% of our entire genome is made up of retroviruses. But this you can know much later. Another possibility is herpes virus. Here, the herpes virus genomes, not the entire virus, that the protein-coated virus, it is only the genomes in circular DNA-like thing can stay latent in your brain, in the neurons or in the blood cells for your life. No antivirals, no vaccines can act on such latent integ or integrated viral genomes. Let's uh, make this more clear to you. See, this is HIV replication in a nut cell. So here you have the HIV virus, which causes AIDS. So HIV infects the CD4 plus T cell. The RNA is released by a special enzyme carried by the virus called reverse transcriptase. It converts the RNA to a DNA. The same enzyme makes double-stranded DNA. As you know, we all have double-stranded DNA in our chromosome. And then this DNA, by the integrase function of the reverse transcriptase, is incorporated in your genome, in your chromosome. From there, the viral RNA is transcribed out, more RNAs are produced, they express the viral proteins, and then the proteins package this RNA to make the progeny virus, and it goes out. So you see a virus has a nucleic acid with proteins, and then outside the capsid, and then you have the envelope. So you see how the virus gets integrated in your genome. Now let's go to the next slides. 1984, Luc Motanier and François Barsinozzi and another scientist, they all discovered the HIV. 36 years of research we have carried out after that, and you have 25 licensed drugs to prevent HIV infection. And with correct therapy, if you take your drug every day, the infected individuals, they can have a good life. And this is called highly active antiretroviral therapy. So we have seen, this is our win over the viruses. We have 25 drugs to prevent HIV and have a good quality of life. But you have to still do more research because none of these drugs can act on the integrated viral genome. That is beyond the question. They can only act at the level of the viral proteins or prevent the viral replication, these ones, or at the level of the viral proteins, but they cannot act on the integrated genome. If any of you becomes a virologist in future, a molecular biologist, and you find a way to eliminate the integrated HIV from the chromosome, I'm sure they will give you a Nobel Prize for that. So strive for it. Next slide, please. So let's now have an overall scenario of the war that is going on. Smallpox. We have very we had very effective vaccine, and this is our win over the viruses. We have successfully eradicated smallpox from the face of the earth. Measles, we have effective vaccines, and with a concerted global effort, we can eliminate it, but some still sporadic infections happen. Influenza, this virus, you know, changes very frequently by genetic drift and sometimes by genetic shift. And in that, so I every season in influenza vaccines have to be reorganized because you have to target the prevalent strain. So in the in European countries, they make different types of influenza vaccines to fight the particular strain prevalent then. Polio, we have effective vaccines, SARC and Sabin vaccine, and it, it is another disease where which we have almost wiped out. Very few incidences happen globally. Now the war which is still on is HIV. We don't have a vaccine yet. We have effective drugs. But you have to comply with taking the drugs every day, otherwise resistance will happen. So more and more research has to be done. It is said in virology that we are just one step ahead of the virus when we have a drug. The day you take the drug, the virus will try to gain mutation to that drug and try to develop resistant mutants. So your research should go on. Anyway, by this time, HIV has killed more than 60 million people around the globe. Uh, they are infected and more than 25 million died. But with proper therapy, now people can live up to 70, 80 years with HIV. 
Dengue, we have more than 50 years research. SARS, we have more than 20 years research. Mars, we have 10 years research. Till now, no specific antivirals, no vaccines, mainly due to the reason of adverse effects in animal models and often because of antibody dependent enhancement of infection, which have, I have told you before. There are other deadly viruses like Ebola, Marburg, for which we don't have vaccine, but they are not that infectious or transmissible like SARS. So that with proper measures, we can control these viral diseases. So how you control viral diseases? You see, first, you, you are very familiar with this term quarantine. So that's how you do control the viral infection. You have import controls. Infectious people or animals, they are not allowed to enter your country if they're coming from an infected area. Notification. You have to notify of an outbreak to regulatory bodies like we have the ICMR. Culling. If you remember bird flu, then you see at that time lots of poultry were culled or they were actually killed so that the infection can be contained. So this is culling. In UK in 2000 what for foot and mouth disease, lots of cattle have to be culled. Then you have decontamination. That's why I tell you use sanitizer all the time to decontaminate your hands. Then, of course, treatment. We have very good drugs for HIV, HSV, and influenza, Tamiflu and Relenza for influenza, Acyclovir for HSV, and I have shown you more than 25 drugs for HIV. Vaccination, I will not tell you about that because you already know that vaccination can prevent a lot of viral diseases, MMR, polio, hepatitis B, human papillomavirus, Hansen Zur. Zur Hansen has been awarded Nobel Prize for finding out that these two strains can cause cervical cancer. So you have now a good effective vaccine for HPV 16, to 8, 16 and 18 strains for vaccinating young women. Of course, insect controls. Now you see Aedes mosquito, they can spread dengue, Japanese encephalitis, the tiger mosquito. So you have to have insect control. So you should not allow water to accumulate nearby your homes or anywhere you see accumulated water old tires, get rid of them. Because if you can control the insects, as you see, the mosquitoes are all, all infected. If you can reduce the mosquito population, incidence of dengue will fall. And of course, public education and awareness, which I'm doing at the moment, like you can, by that, you can reduce different diseases like HSV, HPV, Epstein-Barr virus, hepatitis C virus, and hepatitis B virus, because you see, these are bloodborne viruses. We take these two examples. So that's why you don't use razor blades used in the saloon by one person and you change the razor blade because by razor blade if the blood is there from an infected individual it can get into you and it can cause a bloodborne disease like hcv hepatitis c virus or hepatitis b virus so you have to have you have to be aware of how a virus transmits now this is a, these two slides are there i will not tell you much about it i have just given these slides to make you aware of coronaviruses because it has a lot of information and you people are now aware of coronavirus from the different publications and media. Let's go to the next slide. What I want to emphasize, you see the number of viral RNAs present in your swab. One swab can contain a billion of coronavirus RNA. Your throat contains this many, 10 to the power 8, 100 million. Stool can contain this many. Sputum, you see, 10 to the power 11 RNA RNAs. So that is the reason why you should wear your mask. When you talk to people in outside, you should not take your mask out of your mouth or you take it below your nose. No, this many of RNA can come out of an infected coronavirus infected person because sometimes they are super spreaders. They can contain this many of RNA. So one cough can produce more RNA than people on earth. So in that way, you have to protect yourself with the mask. So always wear your mask when you go out, no compromise, particularly when you meet somebody or when you talk to somebody, your mask should cover not only your mouth, but your nose also. So please remember this because you see, you are dealing with this much minute things and you have to protect yourself. Now, as uh, Dr. Pooja said, I will tell you a little discovery we have made in our lab in recent years, and you'll be very amazed to know how we look at microbiology day by day. It is, it is more complicated than we think, and it gives us new views about the old diseases. So let's see what is Kalazar. You know, Kalazar is actually visceral leishmaniasis. This disease is caused by this particular protozoa called Leishmania donovani. You can see it's a protozoa. As I told you, it is a heterotroph, single-celled organism. And this disease is prevalent in Bengal, Bihar, Assam, Himachal Pradesh, 
and it is spread by the sand fly bite. Now, this protozoa, this disease, visceral leishmaniasis, is lethal if you don't treat it. What happened in the, you know, in, in, in Latin America, another Leishmania parasite, it is not Donovanic, it's called Brazilianensis or Leishmania guyanensis. Their scientists found that this protozoa contains a virus instead inside them. Since it is present in Leishmania, they called it Leishmania virus. And they found out by different studies that presence of that virus actually aggravates the more, they aggravates the disease better more. So the people, if the, if the virus is present in this parasite, then the disease is more aggravated, severe, mucocutaneous dysmaniasis. It's not visceral, it is mucocutaneous dysmaniasis, skin disease type. So the question arose in our mind that whether Leishmania donovani, which is present in India, or in the Indian subcontinent, whether that also contains this Leishmania virus. Despite our all efforts with PCR and other techniques, we could not detect the Leishmania virus in this our Leishmania donovani. But what we found that out of the 22 visceral Leishmania samples we tested, 20 of them contained a different protozoa, not this one, but it is called Leptomonas semori. And Leptomonas semori is a protozoa present in the sand fly. So when the sand fly bites the people, it transmits not only Leishmania donovani, but also Leptomonas semori. And within that, 15 of those co-infected samples had a new virus called Lepsen LV1, Leptomonas semori narna-like virus 1. So you see, we discovered that the majority of Kalajar patients not only have the Leishmania donovani, but they also contain another protozoan transmitted by sandfly called Leptomonas simuri, and within that you have a virus. So now the new concept is emerging, and we are doing lots of research that whether Kalajar is a triple pathogen phenomenon. Now, in this disease, what happens sometimes, people develop later skin disease called post kalaza dermal leishmaniasis. There is, there is lesions on the skin. And if you remember, most of the viral diseases, they call, cause skin conditions like rash, as I have shown you before, mumps, measles, rubella, herpes, dengue. So maybe the PKDL, for which we still don't have a proper explanation, this virus may have a bearing. So future research is focused on that to find, to find it out. So this was covered uh, by the newspaper, and you can read about it. We are very happy that the uh, nation page, on the nation page of the newspaper, they published our finding, and you can read about it later. So we are in, uh, reaching the end of the talk. So the viruses, you see, I will read this out to you. What I, I like this particular paragraph from Hans Ginzer in 1935. Infectious disease is one of the few genuine adventures left in the world. The dragons are all dead and the lance grows rusty in the chimney corner. About the only sporting proposition that remains unimpaired by the relentless domestication of a once free living human species is the war against those ferocious little fellow creatures which lurk in the dark corners and stalk us in the bodies of rats and mice. For example, hantavirus in dormouse, they can cause hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, they are present in dormouse, and all kinds of domestic animals. Your pet dog can be, give you rabies if not vaccinated, which fly and crawl with the insects, dengue, Japanese encephalitis in Aedes mosquitoes, and waylay us in our food and drink, rotavirus, hepatitis A virus, which can get into you through your Golgappa water, and even in our love, like heart simplex virus and other sexually transmitted diseases like HIV. So you see these photos are not fake. This is the actual, the monster, although you cannot see it. And we need many knights and warriors and superheroes like you all to save the mankind in our battle against viruses like COVID-19. So it is indeed a genuine adventure. I think you will believe that. Next slide, please. So you see, I am a virologist working at IICB, this is Indian Institute of Chemical Biology, a laboratory of CSIR. So you can visit website of CSIR and Indian Institute of Chemical Biology to see what the scientists are doing here. If you are particularly interested in the research we do in our lab, you can visit our websites which are given here and you can know more about the viral diseases and how we are working towards mitigation of those viral diseases. So thank you all. So the last message is wherever life is found, remember, so are the viruses. And so our quest continues. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Subhaji. Yeah. So thank you for such a very uh, interesting talk. And um, if these students are aware about different forms of viruses, how they attack human cells and how we can tackle them. So now we will go ahead with the questions. Sure. So first question is from Mihir. He is asking, are there any viruses which attack human brain? Uh, sorry, what was that? Human? Human brain. Human brain? Yes. Yes, of course. There are many viruses which can affect the human brain. Because you see, dengue itself can cause encephalitis. There are a group of viruses which can affect the brain and they can, they can infect your neurons. For example, herpes simplex virus. Herpes simplex virus infects your brains and stay latent in your neurons for life. And sometimes they can cause encephalitis. You see, from the name itself, you will know Japanese encephalitis virus. So it's a flabby virus which can affect the brain. Rabies. Very interesting example is rabies. It can cause acute form of disease in the man and you see the person then behaves like mad. So because his brain is infected, the rabies gets localized in your brain and they produce certain inclusion bodies called negri bodies. So they cause damage of the brain. Of course, viruses can infect your brain. Right. So going to the next question, uh, the question is asked by uh, Ahmed. If same, time of, uh, same type of viruses are coming to our body again and again, can't they produce immunity against our protein interferons? Of course, of course. You are right. If you have dengue virus infection first time, it will definitely produce interference. The virus will produce interference and will try to cure you of the disease. But you see, viruses also have, this talk was of little duration, I cannot explain to you all, but viruses are the best biotechnology engineers you can think of. They will take control of your cell and they will make your cell forget its function. So dengue, there, there are certain viral proteins which can actually degrade the STAT3 part of the JAK-STAT pathway. So JAK-STAT pathway is a one way of producing interferons and your interferon-based response. So that can actually, the virus actually destroys that STAT3 and in that way it debilitates your innate system. Because unless, remember, if the virus cannot break your innate system or interferons, which is a first level defense, it will not be able to produce the disease. That's why your next level defense comes in, which I've told you all the adaptive immunity. So. Although we give interferons and that is very protective against many viral diseases like influenza, that's why you're cold. When you have cold, you get healed by yourself after some time. So your interferons act very well in case of influenza viruses, but not all viruses can be just thwarted with interferons. They are deadlier than that. But also remember, because of our innate immunity, there are so many viruses in this air which are, which are actually getting in and not causing the disease because they are not pathogenic. Our immune system can control it. We don't need antivirals or vaccines, but our immune system can control it. Yeah, very well ex uh, explained, Dr. Subhaji. So uh, there is a question related to vector, but I will club it with another question. Uh, this question is asked by Shriya. He's asking, can scientists genetically modify a virus to make it less dangerous? Or maybe you can relate it with some vectors if you, if you want to explain that way. Of course we can. Yes, that is what you have asked. Scientists are now capable of identifying particular virulence genes in the viruses and we can eliminate them and we can make less virulent viruses and give to you and they are called the attenuated viral vaccines. So there are, most of the attenuated viral vaccines which we use are very good and they don't produce, uh, they can be used as vaccines. So of course we can reduce the pathogenicity of a virus by attenuating them, by removing the virulence genes from them. And this is a very common technique of producing vaccines. Live uh, vaccines, they are better than your killed vaccines. Okay. So uh, in your talk, you also told about like uh, the HIV virus gets its ge uh, genetic material embedded into the human genetic material. So the question is uh, by Kiran, uh, is there any way that we can prevent the disease or we are helping us in those kind of diseases where the virus embed their DNA into the human genetic material? You see, these are very, very 
ओल्ड क्वेश्चंस एंड साइंटिस्ट अराउंड द वर्ल्ड साइंटिस्ट अराउंड द वर्ल्ड फाइंड द टू एलिमिनेट दो सॉरी सम इंटरफेरेंस इज हैपनिंग एट द मोमेंट वी डोंट हैव वेज to actually eliminate the integrated virus from the genomes there are methods coming up to destroy the specifically infected cells even in our bone marrow to get rid of those integrated genomes but they are still at experimental levels they are not still at therapeutic levels often you need to do maybe a bone marrow transplant has been often done to remove the latent viruses in the genomes because these viruses may not be present only in your circulatory t cells but they may be present in your bone marrow where the stem cells are and they are producing these t cells so they are in such sequestered areas that it is very really hard to eliminate every copy of the integrated genome from your body the only best way is to stay on antiviral drugs to keep your virus replication down for herpes this is a nobel prize question how will you get rid of the virus in the brain taking acyclovir you can reduce your lesions but the virus stays in the brain and comes back along the nerve when you are stressed your immune system is stressed and it can cause disease i'm not scaring you i am giving you a beautiful picture of nature's complexity how a parasite is adapting to us coronavirus is not adapted to us that's why it is causing so much damage to us herpes is evolving with us for hundreds of years millions of years and it has it has devised ways to stay with us forever so it is very difficult to get rid of the latent viruses like herpes cytomegalovirus from neurons and your brain cells but research is is being carried out and some lights of hope are there how to eliminate these viruses but we have to bring them to much uh, we have to validate them in much bigger systems and in clinical trials before they can come to us right uh, so coming to the covid 19 uh, question neeta is asking can human get infected with the corona virus from an animal or can an animal also get infected with corona virus that's a very interesting question well you see the corona virus is a zoonotic virus it has actually evolved it as you have read from bats and then from some intermediate organisms people think some other animals like pangolins and it has maybe it has adapted to us so some viruses can really do species jump like influenza bird virus can get into humans that is the avian flu so of course corona virus has this potential of species jump but at the moment i don't think there are enough evidences that these have jumped to other species from humans some people are telling some anecdotal evidences of uh, transmission to cats but then we have to see because you see coronaviruses are sars coronavirus mars coronavirus your uh, other coronaviruses these are human coronaviruses we have seven of them you have uh, oc 43 22 229e nl63 hku1 they are human al along with that sars mars and this sars cov2 but in animals you have huge number of coronaviruses infectious bronchitis in chickens caused by coronavirus transmissible gastroenteritis in chickens caused by coronavirus feline infectious peritonitis feline leukemia caused by coronavirus but there are different types alpha coronavirus beta coronavirus so it is there is possibility because there are lots of coronaviruses in animals we don't have enough evidence yet that it has jumped from us to other animals we have to see but the, 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 being a scientist you have to be open minded there is possibility okay uh, so dr subhajit uh, going to the next question which i'm taking now from the youtube yeah. uh, the question is from by ajay pal is asking what are the various ways vi a virus can enter our body ah okay so i missed the slide on transmission maybe acha <laughs> so you see herpes virus for example if i take the example it can go it can it can go by contact with a infected individual if a person has epstein barr virus then you know in european countries or in western world this is often spread by their social customs if they kiss each other that uh, epstein barr virus can transmit that is that is why it is called kissing disease hiv hepatitis b they can be transmitted through blood and also hepatitis c so the some are blood borne viruses so you see there are different types you know you can get some viral diseases by 
maternal transmission. If the mother is infected, the child can get infected, like hepatitis B. So there are many ways. Influenza, for example. That's why you use the word contagious. Like flu is a contagious virus. Corona is a contagious virus. If, if this wound has the virus, and if I touch it and put it in the nose or near mouth, it can go. So this is by spread, by direct contact. So some body fluids by inhalation, even by eating, if you if you take food, say you are having uh, contaminated food with hepatitis A virus, you will develop acute jaundice. So even people are root, you can get diseases like hepatitis A, hepatitis E, rotavirus. I'm just telling you about the viral diseases. So these are the ways you can get infected with virus. Food and water, skin contact, sexual contact, bloodborne, if I mention a few. Right. Uh, so I think this completes the knowledge uh, required by the students related to the virus. Yeah, going to the next question, uh, again, related to the coronavirus. Chris uh, is saying that uh, I have read was already existing in Wuhan. So did it get uh, more uh, infectivity due to mutation? by which it is causing so much disease. Right, that is an interesting question. Uh, very nice question. I will say it was the O type which was present in Wuhan, the O clade. And then we saw that this virus has acquired a mutation in its spike protein, which is called G600, uh, 600, D614 to G. So at aspartate at 614 position of the spike has converted to glycine. And that clade, which is called the A2A clade, it has caused havoc in the Western world, the USA and the UK. And even now in India, almost 50% of the genomes that have been sequenced so far, they are about this A2A. So you see the spike protein has acquired certain mutations and some uh, papers have come out which say that this spike uh, this particular uh, mutation helps in more infectivity of the virus. But I will say we have to do a lot of more experiments to really come to such conclusions. But of course, there are changes in the spike protein. Uh, if you consider the ones which are more prevalent now than what was present in you now, you want. Again, a large part of the Indian sequences, which we call, if you if you read, you, uh, you may have read somewhere, it is called IA3I sequence, the Indian sequences. A lot of sequences are just localized in India. And they, surprisingly, it is unpublished data, but they surprisingly don't have that D614G mutation. So their S protein is very similar to the Yunnan one. So in India, different genomes are getting on. Maybe some are causing more uh, lethality or infection, but those we have to wait and watch from our uh, medical scientists that whether they can relate with the asymptomatic, the, more, the people who are dying more, if the, it, it has some real association with a particular viral sequence. At the moment, we don't have any concrete evidence for that. But the virus is slightly mutating, not that much, but little bit mutations are coming up. Right, thank you for nicely explaining it. So uh, the question you in the presentation mentioned that virus, they are kind of uh, in between living and non-living. So the question is from Kathy is asking, it is said that virus can have different lifespan on different materials without host. Why is it so? Right, so that's an interesting question. You see, different viruses have different properties, you know? Whether the, prop the virus has a lipid coat on, on it, how big is the virus, how thick is the protein, based on that, the longevity of the virus is important. For example, you know, the uh, uh, rabies virus, if I take, it is very, very unstable. Rabies virus, it falls on the ground, couple of hours, it is destroyed. SARS coronavirus is, you see, enveloped virus. People have done research and even on plastics or something, they have seen such viruses can stay up to even four days. So all depends on to what sort of disinfecting conditions it is exposed to. Say on the virus, if a lot of sun rays fall, then the UV light can cut the nucleic acid. So, and another thing, if you even detect the nucleic acid from a surface, that doesn't mean that the virus is living. You have to take the scrapings from that, put it in cells, and see if the virus can replicate. Only then it is living. So different viruses have different longevity. For example, in the UK, one virus causes havoc 
almost every year it is called norovirus it's a cause it causes winter vomiting disease to total hospital needs to be closed down patients have to wait because the because on the surface you have norovirus so they have to decontaminate it because so norovirus can stay longer on the surfaces and any person touches it they get the winter vomiting disease total hospitals get shut down so depending on the nature of the virus their longevity depends some viruses are very fragile some viruses can stay longer for example your chicken pox scabs your skin containing chicken pox virus is scabs fall around in the hospitals they can stay much longer period of time and they can cause infection that's why chicken pox is quite contagious so you have to imagine they are also variable like us okay so uh, now since we are moving towards the end of this uh, lecture i will take few more questions even though there are a lot of questions and most that's lessons. good that's good yeah so the question uh, is by arshad he is asking will covid 19 spread to mosquitoes because the dengue season is also coming so one should be worried about both right well you see uh evolutionarily viruses have their own hosts so you see the mosquitoes they have to first have the covid 19 to survive in them nobody has tested coronavirus in insect cell lines that whether they can survive or not so all viruses are not spread by mosquitoes there is a huge number of viruses they are called arboviruses arthropod born viruses like insect born viruses so they have adapted through millions of years of evolution to adapt to a particular parasite it is not like that coronavirus mosquito will take mosquito will will take in coronavirus if it if it uh, bites you first you have to know one thing coronavirus is not blood borne not much you don't find lot of coronavirus in the blood it is mostly in the respiratory system and some may be in the alimentary system where ace2 receptors are present but you don't find it lot in the blood so even if a mosquito takes a blood meal it will not get coronavirus and even if it gets it's not adapted to live in insects so the chance of getting coronavirus by mosquito bite is very very unlikely so don't worry about that but we have to be take care against dengue of course because dengue is an arthropod born virus so it can survive and replicate in insects right so we'll take now last question and the last question is by liquid is we said who mentioned that coronavirus stay in air up to certain distance but what distance can you just put some light on that right <laughs> so now i have to have a scale to put and measure what distance so you have to see that experiments have to be done to get to these distances recommendations come from experiments it depends on how the person is coughing how much the virus is spreading look i am sitting in an air conditioned room you don't have to maintain you know the distance i somebody may be sitting far away from me but the air is circulating and it can take my virus from there and infect him but if you are talking to somebody in an open area who recommendation says you have to be some people say 6 feet some people say 13 feet but the point is it's not important the distance you should maintain distance of at least at least 2 feet practically and you should always wear a mask if you don't wear a mask the distance will not save you so you have to wear a mask when you go out or you speak to somebody but so far different it is a dynamic process based on how things are developing people are now saying 6 feet somebody is in 13 feet like that but you wear your mask if two people are wearing mask the chance of infection is highly minimized thank you dr subajit for such a nice session and answering all question with uh, patients and very nicely explaining each uh, uh, answer of each question there are several question you can see once uh, after this talk because this session is also available on our official youtube channel of sir dibyasa and i thank all our viewers students who have been here at this platform and uh, at uh, kvs nvs and state school students who have been with us throughout this uh, webinar and had put a very interesting question I would like to inform to our viewers that we will have next section, uh, next session on 3rd August by Dr. Clay Salvi, Director Sikri. So we will meet again on August 3. Until then, keep learning, stay safe, stay home, and learn new things. Thank you, Dr. Thank Sikri. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.